We don't want Spokane to become another Seattle. We want Spokane to become its own city. Homelessness was the main issue today at a candidate forum for Spokane's next mayor and city council president. And Tom, you're tracking big changes in the forecast. Yeah, it's going to feel a lot more like fall than mm. the summer weather that we've been enjoying. Moisture moving up from the south, cool air coming in from the west. I'll tell you when it arrives next. If you ever had any fear about riding one of these gondolas, firefighters want you to know they're preparing in the event of an emergency. We don't want Spokane to become another Seattle failed policy. Well, he used to live in Seattle, but got fed up with how things are there, and that's why he just moved to Spokane. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Handrahan. And I'm Whitney Ward in for Jane tonight. That man showed up to a forum today on homelessness, where Spokane's mayoral candidates gave different answers to what he wanted to know. Krem 2's Amanda Rowley was right there in the middle of it. John Lee moved to Spokane last week to start school here. He hoped this would be a place he could escape the homeless situation in Seattle. That's why he sat in on this morning's forum with the future leaders of Spokane. Over politicizing Seattle has gone, the homeless epidemic has gone so bad that it's bad as San Francisco, Los Angeles. During the forum today, mayoral candidate Ben Stuckert says Spokane needs more shelters. If we do not want to be Seattle, then we have to have shelters. If we do not have shelters open, we will have public camping in every city park this winter. Lee says he's seen this in Seattle and does not believe shelters will help. Spokane can do things better. Uh, there are a lot of things. Um, what Mayor Candidate Nadine has, I think she has a very good solution to prevent Seattle coming into Spokane. Nadine doesn't believe the city needs more shelters, but suggests waiting a year before deciding how to move forward. I don't think we should be invested in anything before we know exactly what we can and cannot do as a city. Lee says it doesn't seem like Seattle supports its police officers when holding people accountable for the crimes they commit. Police can't do their job. They can't enforce the law thanks to the bad city council. Woodward says the city needs to hire more officers and that this can be done without a tax increase, a point her opponent says is not realistic. Voters voted by 65 percent to hire those 20 officers, and my opponent's response was we could uh, find a drop in the bucket of $5.8 million in the city budget, and I think that's why experience matters, because $5.8 million, as everybody in this room knows, is not a drop in the bucket. Amanda Rowley, Krem 2 News. And now we turn our attention to the East Coast. Hurricane Dorian is lashing the Carolina coast right now, bringing heavy wind and rain. Thousands of people are already without power at this hour, and this is hours before the storm even reaches its peak. Streets in Charleston, South Carolina are now underwater, and a Jeep on Myrtle Beach is being pulled into the waves. State leaders want to warn everyone stay off the beach and out of the floodwaters. If you don't need to be out, don't go out. And in this, this kind of situation, you don't need to go out. Stay off the streets. Uh, it's very dangerous. So on top of heavy rain and flooding, people in North Carolina are also dealing with tornadoes spawned by the hurricane. My goodness. Tom yeah. Sherry joins us now with an update on where the hurricane is right now, Tom. Well, it is just moving north of Charleston right now, and you can see it's a Category 2 hurricane still offshore. But again, strong storm surge uh, in North Carolina, South Carolina right now, moving up towards North Carolina. You can see that we've got, uh, as this continues to advance farther north, we're going to get strong storm surges and heavy rain rainfall all along the east coast as it begins to move up and it may actually move on a land near Cape Hatteras uh, again as a category two hurricane and even if it doesn't move on land it's still spawning tornadoes tremendous storm surge uh, destructive winds and of course heavy heavy rain which of course is causing all that flooding it still remains a category two until it finally begins to move up into the northern Atlantic so again it looks like this entire area right here especially from Charleston up towards Myrtle Beach and then later it will be up towards Wilmington is going to get a storm surge up to seven feet. We're already seeing tropical storm force winds and some hurricane force winds, especially as it marches farther north uh, towards Cape Hatteras, where we think it may actually make a little bit of landfall there. So but just briefly, uh, this could have been so much worse and it's a dangerous hurricane still. Uh, temperatures here well above average. We're at 86 degrees. Wind is out of the northeast at eight miles per hour. Low relative humidity at 14 percent. That will not be the case tomorrow as moisture begins to move into the area. It's going to feel muggy uh, as we get into tomorrow. Look at your uh, 
computer outlay for tonight, calling for rain to be de de uh, developing by tomorrow morning. That's for uh, 6 a.m., about a 40% chance of showers. I think we could see rain or thunderstorms overnight and again, especially uh, Friday morning. Here's the moisture moving up from the south. That will combine with this cool air moving in from the west. That's what we think may bring us the thunderstorms. Right now, we're just seeing a few showers moving out of north central Idaho and then headed over towards southwestern Montana. So look for an overnight low of 60, only 72 the expected high on Friday uh, for the weekend, though, we rebound with more sunshine on Saturday in 84. Another cool front moves in on Sunday. That means more rain, breezy conditions and highs only in the 70s. I'll check the rest of your seven day forecast coming up. Looking forward to that, Tom. Thank you. And as Tom mentioned, Dorian, now a category two hurricane. But when it hit the Bahamas on Sunday, it was a category five. Yeah, and the damage is just staggering. The Red Cross estimates about 13,000 homes are severely damaged or completely destroyed. That is about 45 percent of all the housing there. So now people living in that area are trying to put the pieces back together and they have a little help from one Florida man. He spent about $50,000 at Costco. All that money went to generators and other household goods that will be shipped to the Bahamas once the hurricane passes. The man who wants to remain anonymous says it's important to help each other out. Wow, 50 grand. That's pretty impressive. All right, here at home, Brain Freeze Creamery is back in business. Two locations closed after the owners had $19,000 in unpaid taxes. The Kendall Yards location will remain open for business, but the South Hill location closed permanently. And you may see increased police activity today in Brown's edition. Spokane police are searching for a man accused of threatening people with a gun. They say it happened early this morning near West Pacific and Hemlock. Officers could not find the suspect. You are urged to call Crime Check if you know where that person might be. Firefighters trained for a unique rescue location today, the iconic sky ride over Spokane Falls. Yeah, the 15 minute gondola ride is considered one of the top scenic cable rides in the world. Graham 2's Tim Pham went along with firefighters to see how they'd rescue someone if that gondola got stuck. For less than 10 bucks, you can hop on one of these and see some of the best views in Spokane. It's a popular attraction in town and it's why firefighters train here in case of an emergency. There's nowhere else you can go to get a view like this than on the sky ride. They said the best way to look at the falls is to go on this ride. So that's what we're doing. The 15 minute gondola ride takes riders face to face with the falls as it gradually descends 200 feet over Huntington Park. I'm not usually afraid of heights now, but I don't know about my friends. <laughs> The sky ride was built for the 1974 Expo. It used to get stuck and could sometimes overheat. Over the years, it's been upgraded, and to Andy Bessmer's knowledge, no one has ever been rescued from the gondolas. There's certain places along the route that we'd have to put a person on top of the cars to help rescue. It's why firefighters are getting harnessed in to practice how to get someone out of the ride if the system fails. Stop. Go up one of the towers and put a transition line there so that when they uh, rest years climb up, they'll slide down the cable, they'll get on top of the car, they'll open up the doors, they'll put a rescue harness on the victim and we'll lower them down. There are 40 people on Spokane Fire's technical rescue team. They train in four specialized rescues, confined spaces, trenches, urban searches, and tower rope rescues like they did today. Lower with the doors broke loose, but closed like this, that gives them more protection. Carabiners lock. You get it? More than okay. 150,000 people ride both. the gondolas a year. Captain Bessmer says though they haven't had to rescue anyone, they'll continue training so they're prepared if they ever do. It gives riders peace of mind. They're up there, they're learning how to rescue people, how to get a car maybe unstuck, you know, whatever the problem is, they're practicing at least. While firefighters train year round, I'm told that they get hands on experience here at the Sky Ride once a year. Reporting in Spokane, I'm Tim Pham, Krem 2 News. Scary dash cam footage serving as an important reminder to secure your load. A Washington State trooper posted this video on Twitter. It shows a driver hauling a 1967 Chevelle on a flatbed trailer. Well, there you go. When the classic car suddenly rolled off that trailer and onto the road. Everyone's OK here, but troopers want to stress secure your load. And then when it comes to securing loads on the roadway, Whitney Ward found out there was actually a loophole. Whitney. Yeah, Mark, you've probably seen commercial trucks carrying gravel or dirt, oftentimes without a cover. But if rocks or anything else can fly out of those trucks, drivers behind them often can sustain some real damage. For one Washington man, it was more than just a crack on his windshield. 
I'm driving down I-5 and all of a sudden, boom! It's plastered to fall out the window. While you're driving? While I'm driving. It's falling on the inside of the car, it's falling on the uh, handle, it's falling on my arm, it's falling on me, some fell out on the freeway, I'm sure. And I finally got myself stopped and it, it, I, I was shaken. If that side window had been down at that moment, it could have been my head. Yikes, that's pretty incredible. So that man's name is Jim Burley. He had a very scary situation and had many other drivers wanting to know what is the law? So everyone on the road has to secure their load, but there is a loophole. Turns out big trucks that carry gravel, sand or dirt do not have to have a cover if they leave six inches of space at the top. So there's a house bill introduced in 2013 that would have closed that loophole, but it never became law. So Washington State Patrol troopers say hundreds of calls come in every single day about this problem, mm -hmm. unsecured trucks. They want to encourage all of us to call in if any debris ever falls off of a truck. They say that is the best way they can keep track of commercial companies that are out there on the road. Mm, important stuff, stuff right there, yeah. Man, yeah. Well, a group of parents in Western Washington, they're upset with the dress code at their children's school, and now they are speaking up. I don't want my daughter having to be not given the choice of her creative freedom and expression via her clothing and something that is very important to her. Earlier this summer, the elementary school quietly announced the introduction of uniforms. Many say they heard about the policy from other parents and they're upset that school leaders did not consult them before making the decision. So now a group of parents is protesting the uniform decision outside of the school. Some teachers there are also in favor of the uniform, saying the school district made the right call. The first thing they're going to tease each other about is usually their clothes, and it does lead to bullying. I've seen it happen. It's because you don't have the right pants, and then everyone gets hurt. Hmm. A majority of students mm -hmm. are complying with the dress code, but the parents who do not support the change say they're looking into school transfers or homeschooling.